the foundational words of the book of Habakkuk. This is the bombshell that, that God drops on Habakkuk. And, uh, and it's not only a bombshell for Habakkuk, it's a bombshell for all of God's people, actually. Um, this is a revolutionary idea. This is a new approach uh, for connecting to God. The just shall live by faith. And not only is it important in the Old Testament, but this is also picked up by the early church. So Christians grabbed a hold of those six words, and they basically used those six words to build a foundation of their faith. That the just shall not live by sacrificing animals anymore. All you animal lovers ought to be thankful for that. The just shall not live by slitting the throats of, 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 of little lambs anymore. The just shall live by faith. We don't live by ceremonies and feast days. We don't, we don't live by faithfulness and church attendance. We don't, live, we don't live by tithing. The just shall live by faith. Now, it's not to say that those other things aren't good, but it is to say that the just shall live purely by their faith in Jesus Christ. And so we see this, and it may, may, maybe this is just me, but I, 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 I recognize patterns, and I like patterns. And so what I saw in, in those six words, and I'm not really good at math, but what I saw is you have three groups of two, three groups of two words. The just shall live by faith. And it's interesting because this verse is utilized in the New Testament in three different books of the Bible, in the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Hebrews. And it's incredibly important to all three of those books. In the first book, uh, as it's listed in, in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, so Romans comes first. In the first one, uh, Paul mentions it in the very first chapter of his letter. And it is the foundation for the rest of his book, but primarily the first two words, the just. What does it mean to be just? He talks a lot about who are the just, who are unjust, and how do we become justified, justification by faith. So he says the just shall live by faith, but the emphasis, this is the teacher in, in me, the emphasis is on the first two words, the just. And so we, we talked a lot about that. We preached on that. But then the next book it's utilized in is the book of Galatians. And now this finds its way about in the middle of the book of Galatians. And the emphasis is on the, the middle two words. How then shall we live? How do we live? How do we go about our daily lives? Do we participate in feast days? Do we worry about sacrificial animals? How do we? And, and once again, the just shall live by faith. But it's located in the middle of the book. And he's focusing on the middle of those six words. And the emphasis is right there. And now we find ourselves at the end of those six words, by faith. And this is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we are not quite sure who the author of Hebrews is. I have a hunch it was Paul. Um, but it may have been Apollos. It may have been several other early church fathers. It's clearly the book of Hebrews. It's written to the Hebrew Christians who are coming from their Hebrew faith, from Judaism into Christianity. And he builds, he builds his, his argument. Actually, many believe that the book of Hebrews was originally preached, not written. So it reads like a sermon. Uh, and they believe somebody like listened to the sermon and wrote it down word for word verbatim kind of thing. And so by the time he, he's building his argument, he's building his sermon, okay? It's, a, it's not a 30-minute sermon, by the way. Uh, it's more of like one of my sermons. So it goes a little bit longer. He takes a while in the introduction. And finally, toward the end of the book, at the latter part of chapter 10, he quotes this same passage, for the just shall live by faith. And his emphasis is on the last two words, by faith. So Romans is the beginning of the book. His emphasis is on the first two words. Galatians is in the middle of the book. His emphasis is on the middle two words. And Hebrews is at the end of the book. And his emphasis is on the end of that sentence of those six words, the just shall live by faith. And so that's where I want to hang out today. Uh, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to read directly uh, from that passage Hebrews chapter 10, and um, because I have this digital Bible, it might take me a second to find it, but we're going to look up um, right toward the end of Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to go on uh, verse 35. Let's read from verse 35, and this actually will be on the screen for you if you want. I'm going to look at the New King James Version from verse 35. We're going to read the, the rest of this chapter from verse 35. He says, for you have need of endurance, or no, verse 35, sorry, verse, that's 33, 6. 35, he says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Do not cast away your confidence. Oh, brothers and sisters, do not cast away your confidence. 
He says right here, because it is of great reward. What is the reward of following Jesus? Confidence. What is the reward of walking with Jesus? Confidence. That in a time of uncertainty, you can have confidence. That is the great reward of following Jesus, of walking with Jesus, of living by faith. For the just shall live by faith. And the reward of that, the end of that, is that you wake up in the morning and you live your day throughout the day and you go to sleep at night with confidence. And, and the writer of Hebrews says, don't throw that away. Don't believe that's such a small thing. Trust me, blessed assurance is a huge thing. You must hold on to your Confidence. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. The just shall live by faith, but, but along with that faith, there has to be faithfulness. You have need of endurance, he says, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. What's the promise? What's the reward? There you go. All right. So those see now if, if you're if you're watching online right now, you should have said that in your living room. It's confidence. Actually, I don't even know if you said it. Go ahead and type that. Type that in the, the type that in, in, in the comment section. For those of you that are here, I know you got masks, but come on, like you can you can I was helping you out. There you go. Confidence. Come on, somebody. All right, so it's com that's the reward. But you have need of endurance in order to get that. In order to get to a place of confidence. You have need of something called endurance. And now he quotes from the Old Testament. And this is interesting because this is a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, from the Septuagint, which is why it reads a little bit different. And the, the Septuagint brings out some different uh, details from the Old Testament passage in the Hebrew. But he says, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we, verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back. Come on, somebody. We are not of those who draw back. There are people who draw back, but that's not us. I'm looking at you. That's not you. We are not of those who draw back. You have to believe that because this is the confidence that you can have. Some of us don't have that confidence. And honestly, we're always wondering whether we've drawn back or not. But, but the writer of Hebrews says with confidence, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but rather we are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. How can you get that confidence? Well, by faith. The just shall live by faith. And this is, by the way, just, just to point out, this isn't on the screen, but in chapter 11, that's the end of chapter 10, you go right to the very next verse, and he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it's the evidence of things not seen, for by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. And then verse 3 starts with these words, by faith, the just shall live and then verse 3 says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were formed by a word from God. Now, he's talking about two things there. He's talking about one, possibly creation, but more likely, he's talking about the generations were formed or built by faith. We understand that. And then you go down to verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sa sacrifice than Cain. By the way, uh, I don't have time to get into it, but that's, that's, that's an, interesting, an interesting way of talking about it. And actually, let me, let, let, let me go to the NIV now. I, 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 I got to switch back and forth. I, I like the way the NIV says, by faith, uh, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. That's, that's closer to the, to the original language. It was a better offering. It's not that Cain didn't go to church. It's not that Cain didn't worship. It's that Abel had better worship than Cain. <laughs> So I don't I don't I don't know if this will sit well with American audience, but um, half worship is 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 as is as beneficial as zero worship. God is as interested in your half-hearted commitment as He is in no commitment. For Cain, literally, he was unpleasing to God because he did part of what he was supposed to do. Abel, however, had better worship. Okay, and so we are the better worshipers, all right? I'm, I'm just going to throw that out right now. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but we are of better faith than that. And the better worship is important. And then verse 5, he says, by faith. Enoch was taken from this life so that he didn't experience death. By faith, Noah, when he was warned of things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham, the just, I think you're getting the idea, the just shall live by faith. 
And he's going through the history of the just. He's going through the history of the elders who obtained a good testimony. And every single sentence starts with the words, by faith. Why? Because the just shall live by faith. And everything that they did and everything that they, everything they accomplished in their lives, they accomplished by faith. And we scroll on down to verse 17, by faith Abraham, when God tested him. So just because he started walking with God doesn't mean that he wasn't tested. You will be tested. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of, his, each of Joseph's sons and worshiped and leaned on his staff. By faith Joseph, when his end was near, spoke of the ex exodus of the Israelites. And now this is where I want to, 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 to land is right here near the end of this amazing list. And as a preacher, this would be a great list to preach. But I want to look at verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. That's a powerful verse. This is when Moses had grown up, he had to make a decision. Was he going to be a was he going to identify with the family that he was raised in? Or was he going to identify with the family that he was destined to belong to? And we all have that very same decision. Are you going to identify with the city you were born in? Are you going to identify with the country that you live in? Or are you going to identify with another city, with another country, with another kingdom? And so, so uh, Moses chose to identify with God's people. And actually, the writer of Hebrews kind of draws this parallel. He says here in verse 26, he says, he regarded the disgrace that he received, the disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead, this is key, to the reward. What is the reward of those who live by faith? Confidence. Confidence. Yes, somebody's listening. All right, Mia, you get an A plus for that one. <laughs> he was looking forward to the confidence that he was looking forward to the reward. So he, he was able to go through, he was able to go through some things because he was looking to something and so now we understand in verse 27, by faith, he left Egypt. And this is the verse I've, I've highlighted in red so that you can get it. By faith, he left Egypt. Not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Now, when I was reading that this week, it stuck out to me because I said, wait a minute. Which time are we talking about? Because if you know the story of Moses, he left Egypt twice. He, he left Egypt twice. And, and, and this, 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 the writer of Hebrews seems to be tracking along Moses' life, right? He starts with his birth. He says when he grew up, he, he, he associated with the people of God rather than with, with the Egyptians. And then he left Egypt by faith, and he didn't fear the king's command. So... Interestingly enough, we need to go back in Scripture just a little bit to see exactly which one he's talking about. So if you have a Bible, go to Exodus chapter 2, and we're going to look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. This is the first time that Moses leaves, uh, leaves Egypt. And this will not be on your screen at home. If you're at home, whip out your Bible app or something, or an actual Bible if you have one. Dust it off, open it up. Go to Exodus 2, verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. One of his, see, see, see how it says that several times, his own people. He went out to where his own people were. He watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating one of his own people. He has now identified with the people of God. This, these are his people. And because they're his people, he can't stand to see them mistreated. And so in verse 12, it says he was looking this way and that way and seeing that no one was around, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews this time fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? 
And so the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me just like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid. <laughs> he says, uh-oh. Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Very next verse. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, we see Moses, by faith, left Egypt, not fearing the king. Hmm. <laughs> uh, scripture is funny to me, not just for what it reminds us of, but for what it leaves out. Because I don't believe that Hebrews is talking about when he left this time. He's not, le he's not leaving Egypt by faith here. He is leaving full of fear. You cannot be driven by fear and faith at the same time. He is leaving Egypt by fear. And this is what stuck out to me as I was reading this powerful passage in Hebrews. You have the writer, now, now the writer of Hebrews obviously was a preacher. If, it, if this was an actual sermon, maybe, if not, I don't know. But as a preacher, I know sometimes I leave some things out. You know what I'm saying? Because, because I'm trying to build, I'm trying to share something. And so you can see what the preacher is doing because, yeah, yeah, you guys don't know, but I do leave things out, by the way. That my sermons would be much longer if I kept everything in. I just, you, you ought to just be thankful for that. So you know, they're like, you don't leave nothing now. He has stuff enough. No, no, I, I leave all, I get rid of all kinds of stuff. But no, what, what, what happens is he's building the same, the same narrative. By faith, he starts with Abel, okay? Abel started off just as far from God as Cain did, but then Abel's worship was better. Bam, Abel's stock goes up. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you're used to looking at those stock figures, you know, the rise and fall of things. He, I mean, he's straight up and to the left, or up and to the right. I guess you're looking this way. He's straight up and to the, up and to the right. Okay, that's, that's his, I mean, his, his stock rises. And then he's killed for his worship. Bam, he ends really on a high note. Then you go further into the next one, you see Enoch. Enoch is somebody, like, who's Enoch? We don't know who Enoch is, except that he walked with God. And then God took him. His stock just started rising as he walked with God, and his stock goes higher and higher until God literally, he doesn't die. God swoops him up. I mean, he's, you, you don't end any better than that. The dude's stock was at an all-time high. And then it goes down to Noah. And Noah is just a regular dude living out his life, having a job and whatever he's doing. And then God speaks to him because he finds him to be perfect in his generations. That's an interesting phrase. But anyway, he finds him to be perfect. And so he calls him to build an ark. And Noah moves forward. His stock goes up and to the right. He actually saves all of, all of humanity and the animal kingdom from destruction. And then he has these children and these sons begin to repopulate the earth. I mean, he does pretty well. He ends pretty well. And, and that's what's happening in, in the book of Hebrews. And then we come to Moses, and the writer of Hebrews says, yeah, Moses, he, 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 when he became of age, he identified with the people of God. And then he left Egypt with the people of God, not looking back. He was full of faith, and they marched on out of Egypt. And it's like, well, yeah, but there was... 40 years in between those two sentences. It's so interesting to me that God can sum up 40 years in a phrase. If you want to know what, 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 what phrase he uses, go back to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. And I, I, like I said, I'll be scrolling around here. The, the phrase that, that, that he uses is so interesting to, to, to sum up those 40 years because he leaves Egypt he runs away from Egypt and he lives in Midian for 40 years he's 40 years old when he kills the Egyptian and he's 80 years old when he returns to Egypt there's 40 years there that we would say were wasted 40 years that we would say were useless 40 years that but God doesn't say that about it look at look at what God says it's verse 27 by faith, he left Egypt. This is the second time. Not fearing the king's anger, he persevered. God sums up 40 years of wandering with two words. He persevered. He 
persevered. Wow, could God really sum up 40 years of your failing with two words? He persevered. See, we tend to think of perseverance as constant pressure in the same direction, right? Like this is perseverance going forward. And so we think as soon as we fall back that, oh, we haven't persevered. And here's a guy that for 40 years ran away from his calling, ran away from the place he was destined to be and lived out in the wilderness for 40 years. And yet he, when he decided to come back, the writer of Hebrews says, yeah, he persevered. But that's because the word persevere here doesn't mean constant pressure in the same direction. The word persevere here means strength. And strength comes from all kinds of things. Strength comes from opposition. Strength comes from, from, from failure. Strength comes from mistakes. And mostly strength comes from this right here. He says, from seeing him who was invisible. And so I want to talk to you today about that, that 40 year section because a lot of us are used to reading about and thinking about God's like great generals as guys who are just up and to the right. And yet we look at our own life and it's not always up and to the right. Well, guess what? God can cover 40 years of mistakes with two words. He persevered. <laughs> but it's because of how he ended. Had he stayed in Midian, I don't think that would have been that. He wouldn't have been known as the guy who led, led Israel out of Egypt, not fearing the king. And so the fact that he returned, the fact that he went back and so just 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 to quick give you some 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 more scripture let's go back to exodus uh and we're looking at exodus chapter two we're looking uh at moses and moses has just run away and uh if we scroll down to verse 21 we see that moses agreed to stay with the men or the man this is a man who who gave his daughter zipporah to moses in marriage so Moses runs away, he's sitting by a well in Midian, and he meets these girls, and he marries one of them. And he decides to stay in uh, the house of the father of this girl, Zipporah. Now Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom. This is why. Gershom means a stranger in a strange land. He says, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Moses had identified with the people of God, but now he is identifying himself as a foreigner in a foreign land. By the way, he's in what would become known as the land of Canaan, the land that was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. It's interesting. You can, you can live in the place where you're, where you're supposed to be, but if you don't know who you are, or if you believe yourself to be a foreigner, you will live as a foreigner in the land of promise. You will live as somebody who doesn't own anything in the very land that you are supposed to own. You and your descendants are supposed to own. And so he says of himself, as he's run away, he's, he's, he's left Egypt out of fear, not out of faith. He says of himself, I am a foreigner in a foreign land. And then we see, uh, what, is this, what, what does it say? We don't have it on the, 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 up on the screen, but in verse 23, during that long period, uh, at 40 year period during that long period the king of Egypt died the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God and God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them now in verse uh, chapter 3 verse 1 it says now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro his father-in-law the priest of Midian and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. <laughs> I, find, I think that's funny, that God sometimes, he'll throw, he'll throw something in your life just to see if it'll get your attention. When when because because Moses said this is weird this is a strange sight I'm not used to this this whole quarantine face mask thing this is a weird feeling of social unrest this, this, this is strange and God said okay so is he gonna go is it, have I got his attention yet 
<laughs> and when he saw that Moses went to look, from within the bush, God called out, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. And then God said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then God began to share with him his purposes. He said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I, notice how many times God's talking about himself. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Cellulites. Come on, somebody. And, <laughs> and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now he says, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But look what Moses says in verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I <laughs> that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God just got done with a whole paragraph telling Moses who God was. And Moses was more interested in who he was. Notice when, when he named his son Gershom, he was thinking about himself. I am a stranger in a foreign land. And now he's approached by God Almighty, and God Almighty tells him all of these great plans, things he's going to do, and then all Moses can say is, but who am I? When, when you don't know who you are, it doesn't matter what kind of great revelation you get about God. You will always bring it back to, yeah, but what about me? <laughs> it's amazing. He, he's face to face with the bush that's burning for crying out loud. And he says, well, but, you know, who am I that I should go back there? And God doesn't answer the question because it's a stupid question. <laughs> God doesn't answer stupid questions. God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. In other words, Moses, look, you've been looking at yourself for way too long. The answer is not in there. The answer is I, in case you didn't catch this, Moses, and by the way, when Moses is like, who should I say sent me? Tell him, I am sent you. So once again, the focus is solely on God and God alone. So God says to Moses, look, man, you've been focused on yourself. I'm not going to answer the question of who you are because who you are is not important. I will be with you. That's what you need to know. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. It's interesting. Now, he goes on to share other signs. There will be miracles in Egypt. There will be a staff that turns to a snake, all this cool stuff. But the actual sign that God had sent Moses, he said, look, you're not going to know it when you're standing in front of Pharaoh. You're not going to know it even when he releases the people and he sends you out of Egypt and you walk out with faith and power. You are not going to know it until you come back to this same mountain. And you, instead of asking about you, worship God. In other words, you've been focused on yourself. And the only time that you'll actually know that it is God that is directing you, that is leading you, is when you, are, when you persevere and you get to the place of confidence. The place of confidence is sometimes, like sometimes people only feel like they're actually following God when they're stepping into like the unknown, you know. They're stepping out into new territory. They're gaining new ground. Sometimes though, according to God and Moses' conversation here, sometimes the real test that you're following God is not when you step out into the, the, the crazy unknown. The real test is when you step back into a mountain that you used to be in, but you have a different response to an old mountain. 
Sometimes the real test of faith and the real knowledge that God is with you is not when you step into a new mountain, into a new church, into a new marriage. Come on, somebody. It, it's not your ability to leave something and step into something. Sometimes it's your ability to go back to something that you used to be in and do and, and instead with a different and a better worship and a better attitude. And old circumstances with a new heart. He says, look, you will know that I was with you when you come back. And the mountain's the same, but you're different. And the, the trials are the same, but you're different. I don't know. So this is, this, this is, this is the, the title of my message today. It's real simple, and you can tell this to your neighbor if you want. You can text this, whatever. It's just simple. I'm going back. I'm going back. Does anybody, does anybody want to go back to old mountains with new anointing? Does anybody want to go back to old giants with new weapons? Does anybody want to go back to old kids that you've been staring at with new, with new power, with new influence, with new unction, with new direction? I, I'm, not, I'm not saying we go back with the old mindset. I'm saying we go back to the same old mountain with a new perspective and a new focus, not on myself this time, not on who I am and what I can do and what I'm capable of, but on who he is and what he said and what I believe about him. For the just shall live by faith. Amen. So the test sometimes is your ability. And I'm not saying some of us can't physically go back. Right. It's not like a mountain. So the mountains aren't necessarily, I'm not talking specific actual mountains. I'm not saying you need to go back to Colorado and climb that mountain again. I'm just saying that there are certain places in our lives that we feel like we need to create distance from in order to become something. And Moses had created distance between Egypt and himself in order to try to get peace and get rest and to be who he was supposed to be. But God said, it's not about the distance. It's about the difference I'm going to make in your heart and in your life. So I want you to go back. I want you to go back, go back to the place where you failed. Go back to the place where you fell. Go back to the place where you were so full of fear. Because until, until you get healing, until you get healing back there, you will never live with confidence right here. And so the reward of going back, the reward of perseverance in order, the perseverance that Moses had was to go back, to take the children of Israel back to the mountain that he had come from. And it's interesting because God chose to meet him on that mountain. This Mount Horeb is also called Mount Sinai. This is where the Ten Commandments were delivered. This is where the people of Israel would come and Moses would go up and talk to God as a man talks to his friend face to face. This is where Moses would say, show me your glory. He's such a different man when he comes back. He's such a different man. He's not interested in finding out who he is. He's not looking for himself. And this is what God wants to say. God wants to save us from self-reliance. And so he says, you have to go back. You have to go back to where you, where you fell. You have to go back to where, to where you stumbled. You have to go back to where you, you feel like you weren't enough. So the first thing Mo Moses had to do was he had to turn around. He had been, he had been, he had been facing away from Egypt for 40 years. And God said, I want you to turn around and I want you to go back. And so last week I was preaching about uh, how the world, uh, quoting Vernon McGee, the, God has shut up the world to a cross. It is the cross of Jesus that forgives us, that frees us, that saves us. And I, and, and I was talking about that, and then I had a conversation this week with somebody that really got me thinking. Because it, it's, it's good to put your faith in the cross of Jesus. It's good to step on out of Egypt and leave Pharaoh and sin behind. It's good to go forward with God. But what I find is that for many people, and maybe this is true for you, many people don't doubt that God has forgiven them. Many people have a hard time forgiving themselves. And I had a conversation with someone this week, and I've had several conversations throughout my time pastoring. I, I don't know how many times people have told me I, I'm having a hard time forgiving myself. And so after I talked to this person, I thought, man, you know what? I think a lot of people have this issue and then I'm reading through the book of Hebrews and I'm reading chapter 11 and I look at Moses and I'm like wait a minute how did he go back like 
he was so scared. I know people that have lived in fear for like four months, and it's difficult to, for them to go back. Forty years? You're, you're 80 years old. You're not changing much at 80 years old. You know, like you don't even change music. You know what I'm saying? Like, like good new stuff comes out, you're not even interested in it. You just want to listen to the oldies because that's just what you know. And and, it's weird. and and Moses, though, he shifts. He has this cataclysmic shift in his life where he actually goes back to the very person he was so afraid of. He stands in front of this person and says, God says, let my people go. The very authority of Egypt that he was scared to death of. God empowers him to go back. The just shall live by faith. And, I'm, and, I, and I want to talk to you today, maybe it's more teaching today. That honestly, because we have to go a little bit deeper, because if we're just going to get, get excited about the cross and how God forgives us, and yes, I put my faith in Jesus, and yes, that's great, that's wonderful, and it's really good, and it's some kind of high-end um, theology for you to sink your teeth into, but what do you do after church when you go home, and you lay down at night, you go, you're going to bed, and the memory of what you did, the memory of what you said, the memory of the addiction that you had starts replaying in your mind. And the enemy tries to condemn you and tries to uh, remind you and shake your confidence. What do you do? How do you forgive yourself? Well, that's a good question. So let's... Let's talk about how Moses went back. As he's walking back, he's walking back to a place that he, was, he knew he was destined to be a part of from the very beginning. He knew he was supposed to associate with the people of God. He knew he'd been spared for a reason. He knew there was a purpose to his life, and he knew part of that purpose was to help save God's people. And he tried to do that by killing one Egyptian. And strangely enough, the Bible never condemns him for that. <laughs> He just killed somebody. It's all good. The Bible doesn't seem to condemn him. It condemns him for running away in fear because he was supposed to defend God's people. He was supposed to deliver God's people, but he, he ran away in fear. And so now he's, he's reversing course and he's going back. And what I find is that he was sent back by God. It was not the devil who sent him back. So first off, I would question how I said just a minute ago that when you lay down at night or you're going throughout your day and the devil brings up a memory of something you did, is it really the devil? Is it the devil that sends people back? Now, condemnation is certainly from the enemy. That's not from God. But Oftentimes, we derive condemnation from a memory that I think, I'm stepping on a limb here, maybe God is bringing to your mind. Here's, here's another question. Do you really think that a, a born-again believed believer, a Christian who has put their faith in Jesus, that their mind is so susceptible that the devil can just mess around with it whenever he wants? I don't, I don't read that in Scripture. I don't see where... He can just throw memories into my head. Certainly, there's a battlefield of the mind, and Joyce Myers has a lot of good stuff to say about that. But I just, I don't know, you know, I mean, Joyce, cool. But in Scripture, I don't see that. And I think we often jump to the conclusion that because it has a negative outcome in our life, oh, it must have come from the devil. Maybe not. Maybe when you came before God and you say, God, I, 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 I forgive me for everything I've done. Maybe God took you at your word and, yes, forgave you for everything that you did. But, but, but to forgive you is one thing, but to heal you is something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moses, there's no unforgiveness there. There's, God's not angry. But God wants to bring healing to Moses because the reward is confidence. And so confidence is something that God wants you to live with. So, yes, you confess you know, everything I did. You don't even remember half what you did. You know what I mean? Like, in, like in, 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 in the moment, you're not aware of that. You're not thinking about that. Like, there's, there's a couple of major highlights or whatever, but for the most part, you're not aware, and you cannot be healed of what you have forgotten. And so it's my 
opinion that perhaps it is the role of the Holy Spirit. And maybe it's not just my opinion. I think it's uh, John 16, verse 8. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will, he says, convict. But really, convict means to remind or to convince somebody. He will convince the world of sin and righteousness. Like in the same sentence. We often think of those two things as completely separate. He will, okay, go, he's convinced me of sin. Okay, okay. Oh, it's brutal. It's condemning. I feel awful. And then he convinces me of righteousness. And okay, this is the, that's, that's, that's a better conversation. What if both of those things are happening at the same time? What if God is trying to convince you and remind you of your sin so that you can actually lay it before the foot of the cross? So that you can say, yep, I forgot about that. So that you can lay before the foot of the cross, but not only so that you can be convinced of your sin, but so that you can be convinced of righteousness. Now we know that it's not your righteousness you're supposed to be convinced of, according to Romans, right? It's not, it, it says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of, of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first, also to the, to the Greek, for in it, in the gospel, is revealed the righteousness of God. So when the Holy Spirit convinces us, he convinces us of our sin, and then he convinces us of God's righteousness. Both of those things in the same sentence. Moses, I believe, was not only convinced of his own sin, but he was also aware of the righteousness of God, the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God. And I believe that sometimes when these things pop up in our mind and we feel like we have to feel better quickly, so we need to forgive ourselves. Well, first off, you didn't sin against yourself, so you can't forgive yourself. It's kind of deep. You didn't... I, I know in our culture we view sin as wrongdoing against somebody. That's not biblically... That's not what sin is. Biblically, sin is... I, I, like, uh, I, like, I like John Piper's definition. He says, sin is, is an assault on the glory of God. Amen. It's harmatia is the, is, the, is the Greek word. It means to fall short of the glory of God. It means to, you know, to miss... To miss who God is. So God is glorious. He created you to be a reflection of that. When you don't reflect that, that's sin. When you mar the image of God. That's why David said in Psalm 51, he said, against you and you only have I sinned. Now, David did some rough stuff. He, he committed adultery. So, uh, what about the guy? What about the husband? Did you sin against him, David? Maybe? Possibly? No. David said, it's against you, and you only have I sinned. Then he went out of his way to kill the husband. Hmm, what about the family of the husband? What about his children and his brothers and sisters? Did you sin against them? David says, no, against you, and you only have I sinned. Now, he's not saying that his sin doesn't have negative consequences, and that it doesn't affect people, and that it doesn't hurt people. It's not what he's saying. He's saying that the biblical definition of sin is something that I do against God alone. And so when we feel we have to forgive ourselves, it really doesn't make any sense, because you didn't sin against yourself. You didn't do anything to yourself. You did something to the glory of God. You did something to Him. And so He's the one to forgive us. And while that may make sense logically, the truth is, I can say that and you can say, yeah, that's true. I, I didn't actually sin against myself. But I'm telling you, tonight when you lay down to go to sleep and those memories come back into your mind, that's probably not going to be good enough. But I'm a logical person. So there's your logic for you. You didn't sin against yourself. You're not the judge. Take the robe off, put the gavel down, and receive forgiveness by faith. If it made sense to you, it wouldn't be faith. If you could see it, you, it wouldn't be faith. If it lined up with your logic and my logic, it wouldn't be faith. You must, the just shall receive their forgiveness by faith. But how did Moses do that? How did he get over what he had done? And how did he go back to where he was from? Well, by seeing him who is invisible. And this is something I was sharing with somebody in the church months, months ago. They had a situation in their life that they had an illogical fear of. 
illogical. Like, it didn't make sense. They were afraid of this situation. It didn't make sense. And they had, through prayer and through just thinking, they had come to the conclusion that it was because of this event that happened in their life years and years ago around this situation. And you can sit there, you can talk logic all you want. But the truth is, when you had trauma at some point in your life, trauma doesn't care about your logic. And they had trauma. This is interesting because some of us lay awake at night thinking of things we have done. Others lay awake thinking of things that were done to us. And what's interesting is we derive very similar responses. Condemnation can flow out of both of those. I'm worthless. I'm alone. I'm unwanted. Both of those, the victim and the villain, can come to the same condemning thoughts. And you can, you can express logically why that isn't true, but the truth is, trauma doesn't care about logic. And so there's this, there's this memory. And so the Lord really laid out my heart just to share with this person what God had been teaching me. I think I heard Bob Hemp say something about this in one of the Freedom videos. He said, he said you should always ask the question, where was Jesus? In those memories, where was Jesus? And I, that, that struck me because I thought, well, that's, that's interesting because I also have memories I wrestle with. One uh, that I've shared with you all that I feel good to share is when uh, I was just little. I think I was eight months old, and my parents always told me growing up that I almost died when I was like eight or nine months old because I was the oldest, I was the firstborn, and I was the guinea pig. So they uh, were, tr were testing things out, and, you know, they didn't exactly follow the doctor's directions. What, they misunderstood what they were supposed to do. So anyway, I was so de dehydrated that she that my, my at least my parents took me to the doctor right i mean that that worked out and then they drove they drove me to the ambulance to the er they they strapped me down on this wooden thing the papoose i think it's called and like stuck a needle in my head to start uh trying to get fluids into my into my system and my dad like stayed like in the room like all night every night like for three days i was there and um and i you know i survived obviously everything's cool but but it was it's just kind of this weird memory. It was, I think that's called a, a, pre, a pre-conscious memory. It's one of those memories that I, I, I can't remember laying there strapped and looking at things. But it, 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 it's still, it's deeper than that. It's a deeper memory than that. It's a feeling. It's a feeling of when I'm in trouble, I am alone. And nobody is going to be there to help me. It's a feeling that it's almost like a memory that would come up whenever I would feel lonely, whenever I would feel betrayed, whenever I feel like the people who were supposed to be there for me weren't there for me. And I would kind of have this same kind of feeling like, well, yeah, that's just the way it is. I have to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I have to figure this out because I'm alone. So it's not even the memory. It's what we derive from the memory. And so many of us, we have memories like that, either like where we feel like we were a victim or we have memories where we victimize other people, did truly awful things. And, and, and it comes to our mind, and we derive from that, man, wow, I, I'm, 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 I'm a bad person. I'm alone. I, I'm worthless. Nobody could love me. And finally, God spoke to me. I, after watching one of those Bob Hemp videos, God spoke to me, and he said, where was I in that? Where was I in that story? And it's true, because in my memory, I never imagined where God was. So I don't know, I don't, I don't know about you all in, in your memories, but do you, do you put God in your memory? You might need to go back. I, I think the Holy Spirit brings up these memories because we, we constantly keep erasing Jesus out of them. I can't really hear myself talk at all with this music. If you could turn that down some. <laughs> we constantly keep erasing Jesus out of our memory. We remember the memory as we lived it not as it actually was. And that's what I asked this person. I said, well, where was Jesus? And they began to tell me their version of where Jesus was at that time years and years ago. And I said, oh, that's what you thought then, but no, now. See, I'm, I'm 40 years old now. I was seven months. I didn't know Jesus was there. I wasn't aware of him. I wasn't of his activity. I don't know. But now I know something I didn't know before. Now I've seen the invisible God. He was invisible to me then. He was invisible to me in the hospital room. I didn't see him. I didn't know he was there. I didn't know he was present. I was unaware of his activity entirely. But now I have seen the invisible God, and I can go back in my mind to that place. 
and I can see him, I can place him. And God said, where, where was I? I said, well, you were in the room. Did I ever leave you? No. I said, well, you, you know, you weren't doing much. <laughs> you know, could have helped me out. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, is, uh, he said, well, you got out of there, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, it's because the doctors were, he said, who do you think gifted those doctors? Who do you think in, helped people invent that needle that could go into your head that could actually get fluids into your body? Who do you think inspired the old lady to give her money to build that, to build that, that hospital? 50 years before you were born. What if God had been working long before you took your first breath to prepare you for the moment that he knew that you would be suffering? And what if he wasn't inactive? What if he was working? He said, you're only in there for three days. He said, I have a habit of leaving my sons in places for three days. It's kind of a thing. <laughs> it's nothing personal. It's just what I do. You talk to Jonah. You talk to Jesus. You talk to Abraham and Isaac as they're making their way to the mountain. It just kind of happens. No, but seriously, like, it's kind of a joke. But really, in your life, where was Jesus? You have to see the invisible. He was invisible to you at that time, sure. But he's not now. You've seen him. You can go back. And instead of what your previous response was, you can worship. And you can say, thank you, God, for, for saving my life. That when my parents couldn't be there for me, you were. That when nobody else could help me, you were. That when nobody knew what was coming, you did. Nobody prepared for what was coming, you did. And that's true of us, some of us victims, but it's also true of some of us villains. There's a story in the book of Acts, actually the first murder in the book of Acts, it's brutal, it happens to a man named Stephen, it's Acts chapter 7, and it's recorded that Stephen was preaching the gospel, he was on trial for preaching about Jesus, and he delivered this great sermon, and the Sanhedrin drug him out and began throwing rocks at him until he died, it's called being stoned to death. And there's an interesting little character at the end of, it's at, right at the end of chapter 7, that as the people were throwing rocks, they set their garments, their outer, outer garments down at the feet of the man named Saul, the man who would later become known as Paul. And what's interesting about that is because you're reading this and it doesn't seem to make much sense. Well, why are we talking about this guy? Because none of the other guys are named. The Sanhedrin, the actual evil people chucking rocks, like they don't have names. They're just these nameless people. But here's this guy who has a name. His name's Saul, he's standing. And then, like, it's interesting. You, you turn the page in your Bible, go to chapter 8, verse 1 of chapter 8. And Saul approved of the killing of Stephen. What's interesting is the book of Acts was written by a man named Luke, who was a very close companion, the closest companion to Saul, a.k.a. Paul. And Luke wrote the book of Acts in defense of Paul. He wrote it to a man named Theophilus, who was the judge presiding over Paul's case. Paul was in prison for, oh, preaching about Jesus. And I, I don't know, this isn't in the Bible, but I can just imagine Paul, Saul, is sitting there in prison, and Luke is sitting outside the cell, and he says, so how did it all get started? And Paul says, well... We got we, we, we to tell him the story about Stephen. Stephen really started this whole thing. Okay, great. And this is his sermon. How do you know his sermon so well? Well, I, I was there. Oh, okay. And so he starts writing out his amazing sermon. And then he's like, man, these, these Sanhedrin people, they went crazy. They covered their ears. They yelled. They, they, wouldn't, they, they were completely unreasonable. They're just, they're just angry. They're just angry. And so they, they begin throwing rocks at Stephen. Oh, and, 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 and I was there. I was standing there also. I was holding the coats for these people. Yeah, Paul, we might want to leave that one out. You know, we're trying to build your defense here, man. Like, let's say you remembered the sermon. It touched you. You know, he's stuck in your head. And then you got thinking about things. And you're like, it is Jesus. But like, and Paul's like, no, we need to include that. And actually add a little bit of extra knowledge that in my heart 
I actually approved of what they were doing. Oh, Paul, that's going too far. I mean, sure, you're standing there, whatever. You're, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're a good person, Paul. I know that's not you. No, Luke, that is me. You know me as a follower of Jesus, and I am. But I know me a little bit better. That is me. It's totally me. And I've gone back to that place time and time and time again. And I've wished I could change it. I've wished I could step in there and defend Stephen. Stand up for him. Nobody was standing up. Everybody was against him. And I joined right in. It's interesting because we, we would not include that in our biography. I don't think. I, we would kind of gloss over some things. But Paul includes it. And then Paul says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You need to go back and include something else. What? Well, when Stephen's being stoned, rocks are flying, Jesus actually stands up from his throne and just supports Stephen. Paul, Paul, how do you how do you know this? I've seen the invisible God. In my memories of my awful sin, I've seen what God was doing. Sure, I wasn't standing up for Stephen, but Jesus was. And not only was Jesus standing up for Stephen, Jesus was standing up because he was getting ready to come down and meet me on a road called Damascus. Road to Damascus. And he, and he was... And he wasn't condemning me. And he wasn't angry with me. And he wasn't writing me off. Instead, you know, so if, if, if you want to know, where was Jesus when I was sinning? Scripture says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is on a cross, looking down through time and space. And he saw you and he saw me in our brokenness and in our sin. And he was receiving in his body, by his stripes we are healed. We, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And he says, this chastisement, this punishment I'm taking is gonna bring them peace. And by his stripes we're healed. His, the, our healing comes from his back. Because so much of the time our healing is behind us. It is by facing the memories that we have and seeing the invisible God. To see the one that we couldn't see when we lived it. But we can see him now. So I challenge you, when you lay down in bed at night or you're going throughout your day and a memory comes up of something you did or something that was done to you, ask yourself, where was Jesus? What was he thinking at the time? And see him. Literally, just see him in your mind. Envision him in your mind. See the invisible God. He was invisible to you at the moment, of course. You wouldn't have been doing it if he was visible. If you had seen the crucified Savior, if you saw what your sin was doing to him, you wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done it. But he was invisible, and so we lived our lives as if he didn't exist, but he does. He does, he does and he did exist. He's very real. And you know that now. You have seen him now. So now you can come back to this mountain. And you can step into an old mountain with a new perspective. You can step into an old situation with, with new anointing and with new power. So I encourage you right now, go ahead and close your eyes. And, and just allow, even just allow the Holy Spirit even now to bring a memory to your mind. I don't believe it's just the devil. I think the devil can certainly use it and try to condemn us, but I really don't believe the devil has power over our minds. If we are truly followers of Jesus, I believe that the power is the Lord's and that the Holy Spirit wants to convince us of, yes, our sin, but also the righteousness of Jesus. Where was Jesus? What was he doing? And these things, we try to delete these memories. You delete the memory and you can't have the healing. God's trying to heal you. He's trying to restore you. He's trying to make you whole. As if it never happened. Because when you see Jesus, 
you see that he was living as if it wasn't happening. He was crucified for your sin. He was laying down his life for your sin. And he wasn't holding back because of something you were doing. Something you were caught in, something you were stuck in. No. He continued the mission that he was on because his love was is not conditioned on what we're doing. And so, Lord, we do. We, we go back in our minds. Lord, I ask that you would bring up all kinds of things. Some of us, it's, it's more of sorrow. It's grief. We try to push grief out of our minds. We've lost a loved one, and we don't want to remember that. And it's painful. Lord, let us see the invisible, though. Let us see what you were up to on that day. What were you doing? Were you caught off guard? Were you weeping as much as we were? Or were you welcoming sons and daughters into the kingdom? Lord, help us to see the invisible. Help us to see you, not just at work in the moment and in the day, but all these months and weeks that led up to it. All that you prepared, all that you aligned, all that you put together, all that you built. We don't give you credit for building the hospital. We don't give you, I don't give you credit for, 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 for putting together the vaccine, for giving the wisdom, the hindsight, the insight, and the foresight. For, I, I see the moment, and I see my suffering, but I don't give you credit for all of your preparation up to that moment. Lord, reveal yourself to us. Let us see the invisible God. Let him become visible in all of our memories. We can't etch a sketch him out. We have to keep Jesus just as he is in our present. He is also in our past. He's at work. He's moving. The fact that we're here is proof, is evidence of it. And as we see you, we gain strength. As we see you, we gain confidence. Maybe that's why Hebrews says, let us, let us run the race looking unto Jesus. Let us run this race looking unto Jesus, who is the author, that's the beginner, and the finisher of our faith.